right uh, <coughs> very good morning to all of you uh, i'm arosha disanayaka i'm the president of the ceylon college of physicians for 2022 and it is a privilege to welcome all of you for the very first young physicians forum and to be followed by the college lecture this is a monthly program this is the first for 2022 and it is my great privilege to welcome all of you for this program uh, the objective of this program are twofold for the senior registrars to provide a platform to both showcase their newly acquired uh, knowledge as well as enhance their presentation skills which hopefully will take them a long way in time to come then of course the college lecture is usually reserved for one of the the newer qualified consultants to share with us the very new insights they acquired during their overseas training as well as with their work here so those are the dual objectives of this program and it is especially pleasing for me to actually chair this because back in 2005 i myself presented as a young physician at this forum and had the very great privilege of winning the vijayarama prize uh, for the best young physicians forum presentation so that has very fond memories and 17 years later i sit here as the president of the ccp so hopefully the young presenters who present today will sit here maybe even less than 17 years and take over these organizations right so that's in terms of an introduction so we will have the first presenter for today that will be uh dr preeti disanayaka she is a senior registrar in endocrinology preeti may i invite you to come up uh, she obtained the mbbs from the university of colombo with first class honors she obtained the md medicine from the pgim in uh, in september 2020 winning the john f stokes gold medal in medicine her research and clinical interest is in endocrinology she has presented and published in this area of research and the topic for preeti today will be the future of diabetes is there a cure over to you preeti Thank you very much, sir. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, as the first speaker today, my task is to discuss the future of diabetes and try and find out an answer: Is there a cure? So, why are we so concerned about diabetes? Because we all know at the moment we are meeting two pandemics. one is diabetes and the other one is of course covid-19 so why are we red zone belonging to the southeast asian region we have an exponential rise uh, in the prevalence and new cases of diabetes and we are expected to have a 68% rise of diabetes by 2045 and not only that what about the cost one in 11 adults in our region have diabetes and over one in two adults are undiagnosed about the disease so can we bear this cost so first i will take you through a brief case this is a common case scenario we all encounter so this gentleman 28 year old it officer uh, is coming to you with an annual check up he has a blood pressure of 130 by 80 and bmi is 32 fasting blood sugar is 145 and hba1c is 7% what do you think he is coming and asking us doctor do i have diabetes is there a cure for diabetes doctor is diet and exercise good enough for me do i need to take drugs life long what about the insulin So ladies and gentlemen let's try to answer this man So in my next uh, thir- uh, 25 minutes I will be focusing on the definition of remission in type 2 diabetes 
द मैकेनिज्म अंडरलाइंग द रिवर्सल अ ब्रीफ रिव्यू ऑफ एविडेंस एंड द चैलेंजेस फेस्ड इन प्रैक्टिस सो मूविंग ऑन टू द डेफिनेशन डायबिटीज वी ऑल नो दैट इट इज नॉट अ डायकोटोमस डिजीज इट इज डिफाइंड बाय हाइपरग्लाइसीमिया व्हिच एक्जिस्ट ऑन अ कंटिन्यूअम so a group of experts got together in 2009 and formed this ada consensus statement for diabetic remission they discuss about a cure cure is restoration to good health that means there is no disease afterwards usually clinicians prefer using cure for an acute illness for example acute bacterial pneumonia what what about remission remission is abatement or disappearance of the signs and symptoms of a disease of course at the risk of recurrence later so they thought that is the best term and they categorized the remission into three partial remission complete remission and prolonged remission this is i'm talking about uh, i'm talking this in 2009 but there were lots and lots of controversies developed over the years and in 2021 they developed a new consensus report defining diabetes with uh, multiple experts all over the world including oncologists and according to the according to this new consensus report they discuss whether resolution reversal cure whether they are better terms because all these terms means that there is no disease but they thought remission is the best term so according to the current definition remission they have defined as a return of hba1c to less than 6.5 that is the diagno uh, cut off for di- diagnosis of diabetes that occurs either spontaneously or following an intervention and that persists for at least 3 months in the absence of usual glucose lowering pharmacotherapy so if we can't use hba1c due to certain hemoglobinopathies or other reason we can use the fasting blood sugar cut off or in case if it is available the estimated hba1 uh, uh, estimated a1c from continuous glucose monitoring so moving on to the mechanisms underlying the reversal i will first see the three giants that we all know in the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes we all know that there are these three singers get together and sing a bad tune for the diabetic patient there is increase in insulin resistance in the liver and skeletal muscle and there is impaired insulin secretion from the pancreas because of the progressive beta cell failure all of which lead to persistence of hyperglycemia this is because there is progressive and uh, we call inexorable exhaustion of beta cells Uh, we all know that by the time we diagnose diabetes there are uh, 50% of the beta cell mass is lost and uh, 10 uh, from the uh, di- uh, 10 years from the diagnosis 50% of them will need insulin so what happens initially this was thought that all these beta cells with the ongoing metabolic stress go into apoptosis uh, this is due to mainly advancing age may be the genetics or progressive insulin resistance and because of lipotoxicity glucotoxicity both but over time this concept came that there are um, there, there is this ominous octet that not only three singers that we talked about now there are eight people so five new singers joined the group so let's focus on the adipose tissue there is increased release of free fatty acids leading to lipotoxicity that gets deposited in liver pancreas and other tissues and the incretin effect we all know what is the importance of the incretin effect and what happens in type 2 diabetes that there is defective incretin effect and again alpha cell persistent hyperglucemia 
during the fasting state will lead to increased hepatic glucose output. And the novel member is the increased glucose reabsorption from kidney. And the last is the brain. Usually insulin should suppress the appetite, but in patients with diabetes that doesn't happen. So all get together and uh, cause worsening of diabetes in the patient. This we need to know because if we understand this basic pathophysiology, we can act at multiple pathophysiologic defects and we can act early so that we can prevent the complications. So ladies and gentlemen, now there is paradigm shift of therapeutic strategy of diabetes. Earlier, it was glucocentric. That means we were only focusing about the HbA1c. Then we thought, no, we should reduce the cardio cardiovascular risk. Then now we are in the era of cardio renal centric. What about the future? So can we think about remission of diabetes? Before moving on to the remission, we should know how to uh, reverse the diabetes. So what is the process? So there it comes this twin cycle hypothesis. Roy Taylor and his colleagues got together and developed this hypothesis. Uh, I need your attention for this. So when there is chronic caloric excess along with developing peripheral resistance to insulin, there are two cycles working in our body. One is liver cycle and the other is the pancreatic cycle. So, we all know in the presence of positive caloric uh, balance, there will be increased de novo lipogenesis that happens in the liver. So, increased production of liver, liver fat gets deposited first in the liver, worsening the insulin resistance and the insulin is unable to suppress the hepatic glucose production, further worsening fasting hyperglycemia. And that in turn will lead to fasting hyperinsulinemia. So with time, the liver can't bear this fat burden. So it spill over to the other organs. So this VLDL triacylglycerol go into pancreas. So the beta cells get deposited with fat. And then comes the beta cell D differentiation. So initially we thought beta cells fail going ahead with apoptosis, but not only apoptosis, some cells can go in the direction of de-differentiation. So they become empty cells or they can trans-differentiate into some other uh, cells like alpha cells. And they drive the pancreatic cycle. They are, what happens is, they can't compensate for the postprandial glucose load. So postprandial hyperglycemia happens and that spin the liver cycle again. So this is the basis of twin cycle hypothesis. And in my next slide, we'll discuss how to break it. So again, the same group of people thought, okay, sudden induction of negative calorie balance would reverse these cycles. So if we attain a substantial weight loss and maintain it, that will normalize the liver fat and that will reduce the pancreatic fat. So what will happen? If the cells are recoverable, then these two cycles are broken. And we can attain normal fasting insulin, normal fasting glucose and postprandial glucose. So that is the basis for diabetes remission. This was again proved in numerous in vivo and in vitro studies where they studied the biology of the beta cells. So as I mentioned, this is the beta cell due to numerous genetic changes with the ongoing metabolic stress. Some can undergo apoptosis, some can undergo trans differentiation and de differentiation. But by bringing about this negative calorie balance or losing weight, we can redifferentiate these certain populations of beta cells. So moving on to the evidence, we all know about this study. 
This is one of the largest randomized control studies where they assess the effect of in in intensive lifestyle intervention among adults with type 2 diabetes. Uh, the main primary outcome was assessment of the cardiovascular disease risk. But that was a failure. However, as an ancillary observation, they found out that the substantial weight loss produced by the lifestyle interventions able to uh, bring about this remission. So they achieved 6% of weight loss. With that, at one year, 11.5% uh, of the participants went into remission and 7% remained in remission at four years. However, unfortunately, one third return to diabetes each year. Then comes this short term insulin therapy. Intensive insulin therapy in the initial period of diagnosis of diabetes can reverse the beta cell glucotoxicity and so they can recover the beta cells. So, this is a very small study that uh, they gave three months of insulin therapy and uh, you know, for 10 patients and they found out that 50% went into remission. However, that is in 1986. But across the globe, there were multiple studies about this early initiation of intensive insulin therapy and multiple uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis showed the marked improvement in insulin resistance and beta cell recovery showing diabetic remission. However, the results are short term. Now comes the famous fellow. This is the very low calorie diet we all talk about. So historically, very low calorie diet gained attention in 1970s with weight reduction strategies. And it usually consists of a liquid diet formulation containing 400 to 800 kilocalories per day. And they give this diet for 12 to uh, 16 periods and achieve the weight loss and then they reintroduce the solid food. This contains 50 to 60 percent of kilocalories from uh, carbohydrate to prevent the ketosis. It contains essential fatty acids, high biological value protein, very little fiber so patient can develop a uh, lot of GI symptoms in the initial period and it contains sufficient vitamins and minerals. So the use of very low calorie uh, diet was checked by the same group of people that is Roy Taylor and his colleagues in counterpoint study. They are with the initiation of this diet within seven days they noticed that the hepatic fat content fell, uh, fell in 30 percent. And within seven days, there was improved hepatic insulin sensitivity and fasting blood sugar fell to normal. Thus, fasting blood sugar parallels hepatic insulin sensitivity. However, the beta cell recovery was a bit slow. It took eight weeks for the beta cells to recover and for the return of first phase insulin response. This was again proved in the counterbalance study where they all proved after eight weeks of a very low calorie diet, they achieved a 15% of weight loss and 40% achieved remission in diabetes at six months. So they, uh, they now got together and discussed who are the responders. Those who are younger with shorter duration of diabetes with lower initial fasting blood sugar and HbA1c like in our patient and higher insulin level and lesser total fat mass. They had greater hepatic fat content, alkaline uh, ALT and insulin resistance. So both of the responders and non-responders had expected weight loss and normalization of liver fat content and insulin sensitivity as well as the pancreatic fat but the recovery of the first phase insulin response was seen only in the people I discussed earlier. This was studied in a primary care setup. Uh, this is one of the largest trials uh, in diabetic remission. They used 306 overweight and obese adults with recent onset diabetes less than six years in three phases. According to this study, they found that 
with the initial very low calorie diet they achieved a marked reduction of weight with that 46% went into remission at 12 months and it persisted in 36% at 24 months however they also noticed that if you achieve more than 10 kg loss at 12 months majority about 50% are in remission This is diadem. This is the study. Uh, they again uh, check the same hypothesis in Middle East and North African community. They again proved the same thing, where they found that remission was seen in 61 percent at 12 months, and achievement of normal glycemia seen in 30 percent. What about the existing pharmacotherapy? There is existing pharmacotherapy improves beta cell function. This was studied in this rice consortium, but effects last only as long as the treatment. If you can see here in the uh, the purple line is the liraglutide and metformin. They all achieved a marked reduction of HbA1c, but at 12 months when you stop all these medication, again it relapses back into the diabetes status. we all know about bariatric surgery even though we are not in favor most of the time but we have evidence for bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery over 30 years uh, all all the studies both randomized control studies as well as observational studies showed that there is type 2 diabetes remission observed more than 50% or sometimes more than 60% Uh, in those who achieve weight loss and in about 80% of the people who undergo bariatric surgery attain good glycemic control so these are the uh, meta analysis that show uh, the remission rates as you can remember it is all about 70% here again same in the observational study it uh, mentioned the same so how bariatric surgery remits diabetes we know that there is reduction of uh, weight but that is not the only cause because we see the improvement of diabetes or the hyperglycemia within hours or within days of bariatric surgery so it is not only the weight reduction but there are multiple mechanisms the gut brain and liver axis gets activated and there are changes of the intestinal microbiome and bile acid flux and many cytokines chemokines come into play so not only the weight reduction there are multiple mechanisms causing this improvement of hyperglycemia so let's see what are the challenges with all these interventions so i discuss with you all about the very low calorie diet existing pharmacotherapies lifestyle interventions as well as the short term intensive insulin therapy so what about the availability and feasibility in our setup is it available to all of us and what about the patient acceptance and adherence so will our patients be adhered to a very low calorie diet that is a question and will they accept early initiation of insulin therapy because we all know in our part of the world there is great inertia for both patient as well as clinician inertia for initiation of insulin and affordability uh, in our part of the world again bariatric surgery whether they can bear the cost whether it's available widely that's again a concern and the other concern is uh, we know as asians we have less bmi compared to the western world so majority of our type 2 diabetic population have bmi less than 33 so can we apply the same concept that they uh, checked in all these studies and almost always we have to keep in mind that there is chance of relapse and nothing is without risk so what are the benefits of coding remission of diabetes so uh, i would like to ask a question would you like to uh, would you like to be a diabetic 
are you all okay with that term no so if we can come into a remission we can remove the social stigmatization for our patient and if we provide a target and a reward for the sustained hard work which is usually necessary to achieve and maintain substantial weight loss so we can keep the remission and even though this is not a big concern in our part of the world we all know the uh, concerns with insurance and mortgages come into play a very big role in uh, other parts of the world and certain occupations especially if we use insulin therapy there are certain restriction that also we can address so ladies and gentlemen my take home message for today is diabetes even though it's a chronic disease can be reversed but we can't cure diabetes at the moment and long term surveillance is needed even after remission we need to select the correct patient for remission not all patients let's say if a patient is coming after 10 years of diagnosis of diabetes can we give him a false hope of remission of course not so we need to correct the appropriate patient to undergo remission and then we can proceed and the other important thing is the best approach of management is starting treatment early and we need to address the multiple pathogenic mechanisms in order to prevent all the complications of diabetes so hopefully i think i have addressed all the questions of this gentleman and thank you very much for the kind listening uh -huh. Thank you, Preeti, for uh, the lecture. May I invite the judges to for any observations or any comments, uh, any questions, and thereafter we'll open the house for five minutes uh, for questions. Do the judges have any questions or any comments to make? Uh, Dr. Preeti, I'm Upolisana, one of the judges. Uh, are there any local experiences on these sort of uh, interventions? Have there been any any, any studies uh, either locally or in the indian subcontinent sir uh, with regard to uh, insulin therapy of course we don't have but uh, for bariatric surgery of course we have very much established data uh, very low calorie diets we use for uh, obese population but we have not particularly studies diabetes remission per se the problem is with our scientific evidence even though we practice we have not documented i think in our part of the world i have two questions one is uh, about your patient would you still use insulin for the patient whom you have shown number two is what about the ileal cell transplant is it, is that coming as a cure for diabetes Uh, madam islet cell uh, first i would address this islet cell transplant uh, it is not considered as an option for cure or remission in diabetes in type 2 diabetes mellitus because the data is scarce but of course in type 1 diabetes we can discuss about the pancreatic uh, transplantation and uh, stem cell therapy and all so that is why i didn't touch on that topic here uh and um, uh, your uh, first question is what is your patient whom the case vignette you have shown yes so would you consider insulin as an option for that patient uh in this patient madam of course uh, initiation of insulin is not only our decision we need to discuss with the patient with this uh, recent covid uh, epidemic we have seen many patients like this but none of them are willing to start insulin to be frank so of course with his bmi i would like to give him a chance and we can start intensive lifestyle intervention because these young people sometimes they go into very good lifestyle adherence as well as pharmacotherapy 
but of course if someone is motivated enough to uh, get insulin therapy of course we can start but what what is studied in this research are continuous subcutaneous insulin infusions for that will not be feasible in our setup right okay thank you Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? If there is no, uh, please. If there is a question, you may ask. Otherwise, there is an online question which I will direct to Preeti. Anybody with any questions? It's, right. Okay. There is. A, it's coming. I'll have to see. What are the uh, thinking of that? That's a question from. an online uh, viewer for you preeti uh, sir of course with regard to uh, dietary strategies there are several uh, diet plans uh, we all know that uh, certain people practice their intermittent fasting there are this keto diet there are mediterranean diet however what is studied and uh, what is there in the literature is the very low calorie diet right yes just one little question uh, do we have to omit metformin also to call it remission no sir we need to take off all the medications to uh, call it remission right uh, Thank you very much, Preeti, for a very in-depth discussion as well as answering, providing very clear answers to the questions. It's my great pleasure to present you with a certificate from the Ceylon College of Physicians. Thank you, sir. Right. Let's move on to uh, next. Uh, next, may I invite the second speaker for this afternoon? Will be Dr. Nilanga, Dr. Nilanga Nishad. He's a senior registrar in gastroenterology. Uh, he graduated with MBBS from the University of Kalania. Obtained the MD Medicine from the University of Colombo. Has an Uh, has an MSc in community medicine and a diploma in public health in epidemiology and uh, he has a high number of publications and abstract presentations with an h index of 4.0 so i'm sure he's combining his his knowledge from epidemiology with his work to do good research Uh, it appears so so it's my great pleasure to invite dr nilanga nishad to speak to you on assessment and management of clinically significant portal hypertension csph in year 2022 over to you nilanga thank you thank you very much sir, for the kind introduction uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, today i uh, thought of uh, discussing some uh, information regarding the assessment and management of clinically significant portal hypertension which is uh, relevant to the new year so the outline of the talk would be i will be talking about the portal hypertension the clinical significant portal hypertension and how it is measured and the hepatic venous pressure gradient as a predictor of uh, decompensation and the non invasive test the fibro scan and how it can predict clinically significant portal hypertension uh, the bavino 7 guideline and the role of five liver stiffness measurement the initial management prevention of decompensation and a new concept called recompensation anyway nearly 2000 years ago the Ro uh, the famous roman anatomist galen believed that the liver is the principal organ of the human body and also he thought that liver is the organ that produces blood to be distributed throughout the body still i know most of the gastroenterologists believe the liver as the principal organ of the body uh, the first uh, drawing of the portal circulation came in 
the uh, famous anatomy book called De Humani Corporis Fabrica in 1543. Now we know that uh, the circulation of the liver is with this portal venous blood flow. The portal vein takes the nutritious blood from the gastrointestinal tract to the liver and the liver via its hepatic veins, hepatic vein through the inferior vena cava take the blood into the right side of your heart. So simply the portal hypertension is increased pressure within this portal circulation. More than 5 millimeter mercury that is the normal level. So how does this portal hypertension happen? It has to be obviously some blockage in this system. So it can be prehepatic or it can be post hepatic blockage. Further complicate in the matter, the liver, the architectural or the structural changes in the pre-sinusoidal, the sinusoidal and the post-sinusoidal area, the most complicated histology I can remember in my school days will lead to uh, the portal hypertension. So, Anyway, the clinically significant portal hypertension is defined as elevated hepatic venous blood pressure, hepatic venous pressure gradient more than 10 millimeter mercury where all the disastrous complications begin to occur in a patient. So why do people get portal hypertension? Obviously the red arrow shows that it is most of the time due to cirrhosis. The cirrhosis can be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or it can be alcohol related liver disease or viral origin or any other etiologies. So from top to bottom you have so many causes, the bud carry syndrome, the intrahepatic pre-sinusoidal causes, schistosomiasis, uh, the hepatic fibrosis, so many medications, toxins and the sarcoidosis as well as further down in the liver the portal vein thrombosis due to any cause can lead to portal hypertension. Why it is important? Because the NAFL, the correct term at this moment is metabolically associated fatty liver disease epidemic is real in this world. Estimating global prevalence to be 24% in 2016 and uh, Professor Dasanayaka and team found in 2009 in the Ragam Health study the NAFLD prevalence to be 33% and 6.2% incident rate was recorded in 2017 by Prof. and team. But unfortunately we don't have enough data on the other things. So what Dr. Mananjala Senanayaka did in 2012, he evaluated the alcohol related cirrhosis patients in Ragam hospital in 2012 and found more than 50% of the cirrhotic patients come into hospital are due to alcohol. We don't have the other data. Anyway, all the cirrhotic patients, most of them will have clinically significant portal hypertension at some point of time. So why it is important to this audience, why the clinically significant portal hypertension is so significant because most of the patients will come with so many complaints. The neurological manifestation of hepatic encephalopathy, upper GI bleeding, the liver failures, hepatocellular carcinoma, ascites, bacterial peritonitis, hepatorenal syndrome are the complications of clinically significant portal hypertension. Pardon me ladies and gentlemen, I will not be able to talk about portal hypertension without talking about cirrhosis because that is that much common and that is the most, uh, most, uh, co most etiology for the clinically significant portal hypertension. So if you think back, why do cirrhotic patients become ill and die? Now you can realize 
it's due to the clinically significant portal hypertension or the portal hypertension. So what I want to highlight is the decompensating events, the bleeding, ascites, encephalopathy, or the jaundice, etc., etc., are uh, directly proportional to the portal pressure. So, if a patient is having portal uh, pressure, the hepatic venous pressure gradient less than 10, most of the time they will be compensated over a period of time. If they have a higher value of uh, hepatic venous pressure gradient, that is clinically significant portal hypertension, they will develop ascites, varices, HRS, HCC, etc., etc., and further rise of the hepatic venous pressure gradient will lead to further disastrous com complications. But the problem is how to measure the portal pressure. So you need a catheter to be inserted through a peripheral vein intending that it will reach the hepatic vein to get the portal pressure. Further, at the wedge pressure level, so you will get a difference and you will measure the hepatic venous pressure gradient. Now the newer modality is you cannulate your hepatic vein through a upper GI endoscopy endoscope and get that value and further down in the endoscopy you go to the stomach and you can you cannulate again the portal vein and you will get a pressure difference that is the hepatic venous pressure gradient. So is it practicable? Of course not, because it is invasive and interventional procedure that requires so much hi-fi stuff. And most terrifyingly, it's performed under sedation and the anesthesia and the extra cost. And it is an increased risk for a diagnostic procedure, more cons than the pros. So up to now, what we know, decompensating events, it's related to the portal hypertension. So if there are any other things that can predict the portal venous pressure or the hepatic venous pressure gradient, that is marvelous. So we have that. That is called elastography or the fibro scan and with some of the biochemistries and the hematology. So the liver stiffness measurement with the fibro scan is the answer, my friends. So it will examine a volume 100 times bigger than a liver biopsy, and it has been validated with the histology, and the values are disease-specific. NAFL, some value, and the hepatitis B, some value, hepatitis C, some value. And it is dependent on the body mass index also. So how to measure the liver stiffness? It is with the transient elastography or the fibro scan that is available in Sri Lankan setup in Ragam Hospital and I think in the Candy Hospital as well as in some private sector hospitals. There are so many other imaging modalities that can measure the liver stiffness measurement that is not practiced in our setup. Uh, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, how to refer a patient for a fibro scan? So, as a physician with your smartphone in your hand, with some basic investigations, you can measure the fibros FIB4 score. If it is less than 1.3, you can exclude clinically significant portal hypertension by excluding the fibrosis. If it is more than 3.2, that's obvious that the patient is having fibrosis. In between those two, you have to go for fibro scan. There are so many other, uh, so many other non-invasive tests and the predictors also. So again, going away from my topic, I have two patients for you. One is Mr. Sirisena and the other one is Mr. Nandasena. Obviously, the ages may not be correct. Look at this and tell, think which patient has a higher risk of fibrosis or the clinically significant portal hypertension.
yes obviously people think nanda sena is correct but he is not always the poor guy siri sena i calculated with my smartphone found to have a fib four score of 1.93 obviously he is having cirrhosis obviously same fibrosis he is not aware that and nanda sena is well aware that he is doing well at this moment anyway siri sena needs a fibro scan both of them can buy at least 10 machines because one fibro scan machine will cost around us 50000 50000 dollars with a maintenance cost of 8500 per year for the maintenance so it will give the liver stiffness measurement with the kilo pascals so again i want to highlight that the decompensating events are directly proportional to the portal pressure which is directly proportional to the fibrosis so the first thing is proportional to the last thing also anyway in uh, this there is a small city in italy called bavino where the first meeting regarding the portal hypertension as well as the cirrhosis took place in 1990 with some gastroenterologist and hepatologist and they met for the seventh time in the same venue few months back and they gave consensus and recommendations they told the a new term called compensated advanced chronic liver cell disease that is actually cirrhosis compensated cirrhosis they want to make a continuum between the fibrosis and cirrhosis anyway the words may be same so what they are recommending at this moment is the transient elastography or our fibro scan can used for early identification of clinically significant portal hypertension as well as developing decompensation and liver related death in cirrhotic patients so with the fibro scan if the liver stiffness is less than 10 you can rule out cirrhosis if it's between 10 to 15 it will suggest compensated advanced chronic liver disease if it's more than 15 that is highly suggestive of compensated cirrhosis in a cirrhotic patient if you measure the liver stiffness and if it is less than 10 kilo pascals he will have a negligible three year risk of decompensation as well as liver related death you can go for invasive methods in individualized manner at the referral center such as liver biopsy or the hepatic venous pressure gradient if you want so we talk about diagnosis of cirrhosis with a fibro scan now we can we are talking about the diagnosis of clinically significant portal hypertension in patients with compensated cirrhosis so non invasive test are accurate for estimating clinically significant portal hypertension if it is the liver stiffness less than 15 with a platelet count of more than 150 again you can rule out clinically significant portal hypertension in patients with cirrhosis if it is more than 25 you will rule in the clinically significant portal hypertension especially in virus related alcohol related and non obese nas people the problem arises between 10 to 25 where you need to go for something called anticipate model in bavino 7 criteria they mention if somebody is having a liver stiffness between 15 to 20 coupled with platelet count less than 120 he is having clinically significant portal hypertension as well as between 20 to 25 if the platelet count is less than 150 again he is having clinically significant portal hypertension between 10 to 15 the rule in is a problem because of lack of data ruling out as i mentioned in the previous slide they have given the recommendations so the bavino 7 guideline they are telling the rule of 5 that is 
10, 15, 20, 25, more than 25, that uh, denoting the progressively higher relative risk of decompensation and liver-related death independently of the etiology of the cirrhosis. Anyway, the liver stiffness measurement is a good diagnostic tool as well as uh, it's a good prognostic tool. So it is useful both at the index and even at the follow-up. So how to moni monitor the patients with cirrhosis? If the liver stiffness is between 7 to 10, an ongoing liver injury, which will be evident by the biochemistries, you have to monitor the patient on an individualized manner. If the patient is having compensated cirrhosis, you can do your stiffness measurement every one to three years. On the other hand, if a patient with cirrhosis has a decline of liver stiffness measurement, more than 20% who are having less than 20 kilopascal liver stiffness or any decrease to obviously less than 10, we can jolly well say clinically significant decline of the liver stiffness that is also associated with substantially redu reduced risk of decompensation and liver related death. The new concept, the spleen stiffness measurement. You will come across a patient with portal hypertension, the bleeding, upper GI bleeding is there. You check the liver, liver is normal. So what to do? What we can do is we can put the probe to the spleen and if the spleen stiffness is higher, we can rule in clinically significant portal hypertension that is more practicable and very easy. So how to prevent the first decompensation in any cirrhotic patients? The non, the beta blockers, the non-selective beta blockers, they will prevent the decompensation in patients with clinically significant portal hypertension. The carvedilol is the preferred drug. It will reduce the hepatic venous pressure gradient and has a greater benefit to prevent decompensation and it's better tolerable as well as it will improve the survival. The, the banding or the glue injection will not obviously prevent ascites or encephalopathy. That is only symptomatic treatment and high risk varices and patients having contraindications or not tolerating beta blockers, you have to go for banding. There's no other options. There are few options other than the upper GI endoscopy. And mind you, there's no indication to use beta blockers in patients without clinically significant portal hypertension. So people will have some gray area in this area. They want to start the beta blockers, but you have to show that patient is having clinically significant portal hypertension. So why carvedilol? I have already answered. The carvedilol has been shown with so many studies as it is better than propanolol at this moment. And the other important aspect is the etiological management of cirrhosis. That is removal, suppression of the primary etiological factor. What does that mean? That is sustainable virological response in hepatitis C virus or HBV, hepatitis B virus suppression in the absence of co-infection with hepatitis D in chronic hepatitis B virus patients and long-term abstinence, at least more than one year, in alcohol-related liver disease. So with these, you can achieve the resolution of clinically significant portal hypertension with management of other comorbidities such as diabetes management and the control of the body weight and etc. And the other impact of non-etiological therapies are the statins. Statins has shown that it will decrease the portal pressure and improve overall survival. The drug of choice is the simvastatin. You can use in child's A and child's B. And keep in mind the lower dose of simvastatin because the muscle and liver toxicity, it can aggravate. And child C cirrhotic patient, the simvastatin has not shown any promise. And aspirin, 
should not be discouraged in this patient. It will reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma and liver related complications and even death. The other non-etiological therapies are the primary antibiotic prophylaxis in GI hemorrhage. These are the recommendations given by the Bavino 7 guideline. In child C cirrhotic patients with low protein, low protein at acytic fluid at high risk of SBP. So those also can be given primary prophylaxis. The rifaximin, all of you know, for the hepatic encephalopathy. The nofloxacin is the drug of choice for bacterial peritonitis and anticoagulation is not discouraged because it is also reduced liver related outcomes with or without portal venous thrombosis and it will improve the overall survival also. Direct oral anticoagulants can be used in child A and child B that is not recommended in child cirrhosis because of unavailability of the uh, studies. So how do you prevent further decompensation? You have to consider for the liver transplantation. No options from there onwards for cirrhotic patients. Screening endoscopy and the transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt for recurrent ascites. For varices, the carvedilol and banding depending on the size and the nature of the varices. If the patient is having hypotension or the hepatorenal syndrome or AKI, you need to stop the beta blockers. Of course, for patients not tolerating beta blockers, banding and ligation. For portal hypertension, gastropathy with bleeding, beta blockers are beneficial after excluding gastric antral vascular ectasia. So this is what transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt the interventional radiologist will put a stent between the hepatic vein and the portal vein to make sure there's a free flow between those two in order to reduce the hepatic venous pressure gradient. So now comes to the uh, new concept called recompensation. So see, talk about diabetes and keo, why we are lacking behind, we are having recompensation. So, the removal or suppression or cure of the primary etiology of the cirrhosis, you need to control the primary etiology. Then resolution of the portal hypertension related things, the resolution of ascites without diuretics and without hepatic encephalopathy or lactulose and rifaximin and absence of recurrent variceal hemorrhage for at least one year. So the etiology is controlled and the symptoms are controlled. So then you go for biochemistry and see the albumin, INR and bilirubin are normal or not. If those are normal, then that is called as recompensation. Those patients are coming to our clinics. We have seen them. And uh, But the problem is the clinically significant portal hypertension as the aluyatagindara will be there. They persist despite the recompensation. The beta blockers should not be there for discontinued unless the clinically significant portal hypertension resolves. And absence of decompensation after treatment and still with altered biochemistry cannot be labeled as recompensation. For few words regarding these venous occlusions. The long-term anticoagulation is required for blood care syndrome and angioplasty, stent, thrombectomy, thrombolysis, tips or the liver transplantation may be the ultimate treatment option. And the portosinusoidal vascular disorders, the portal vein thrombosis need hematology workup and anticoagulation, anticoagulation after treatment for the varices. Of course, the exercise and weight reduction also has shown that they are also reducing the portal hypertension. So, ladies and gentlemen, finally the take-home messages. The clinically significant portal hypertension that is less than 10 hepatic venous pressure gradient will predict the decompensation and liver-related death. And the fibro scan can predict the clinically significant portal hypertension. What we need to highlight, the, our government 
regarding the fibros the value of fibroscan and some gastroenterologists believe it is the stethoscope of them and carvedilol has benefits in prevention of decompensation and simvastatin can reduce portal hypertension aspirin and warfarin are friends they are not enemies of cirrhosis and try to achieve recompensation for your patients so thank you very much for your patience for listening to me thank you very much thank you very much uh, we have only about 1 minute left uh, may i direct the uh, may i invite the judges to ask any questions that they might have uh actually the fibro scan we are at, at the moment we are not doing fibro scans for the cirrhotic patients madam at this moment what we are doing is for the gray area if a patient is having fib4 score more than 1.3 and uh, less than 3.2 then we are going for the fibro scan at this moment in sri lankan setup we are not practicing to identify clinically significant portal hypertension with the fibro scan what we do is we are going to identify the fibrosis the liver with the liver stiffness uh, but it can be used if we have enough fibro scans in the country okay thank you All right <clears throat> thank you ma'am uh, right okay it's my pleasure dr nilanga to present this certificate